This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Friday Morning Conference. Uh, as you can see this morning, our speaker is Dr. Colin O'Brien. Colin, if you haven't if you haven't met Colin yet, he's one of our first year fellows in the clinical track. Uh, he did his undergraduate studies at Brown University, did medical school at Stanford, and then back to New England for his internal medicine training at Beth Israel. Uh, as you can see, he's going to talk to us today about clot in transit. Colin. All right. Thanks, Dr. Williams. Um, yeah, so the topic for today is clot in transit. This is primarily based on a case that I saw back in September of this year um, that I was involved with when I was on call overnight. And then I actually ended up seeing a second case of this the last month when I was on heart failure at Midtown. And kind of after seeing this twice in six months, I knew that I wanted to dive a little bit deeper. I know uh, clot in transit is, you know, fairly uncommon, probably not a talk that's going to be preparing you for boards or anything like that, or one that you're going to see every week. But it is a situation that carries, you know, very high risk of mortality. And there's a lot of uncertainty about uh, the best uh, way to manage these cases. Um, so I hope you'll find it an interesting review. Um, and I guess if seeing it twice in my first six months of fellowship is any indication, um, it's something you're probably likely to see a handful of times in your career. And I know that many of you already have. Um, so, see again, get this to work. Okay. So, um, I'll start with the case and I'll just introduce you to this case. So this was an 81 year old woman with a history of atrial fibrillation, not on anticoagulation, uh, hypertension, diabetes, heart failure with reduced EF, uh, who presented with abdominal pain and fatigue for about five days or a week. Uh, her admission physical exam is here. This is in the emergency room and I'll just draw your attention to a couple important findings. So one is importantly normal-ish blood pressure and fairly normal oxygenation as well, um, but she was tachycardic. And then you can see in her initial exam, they documented a um, elevated JVP and they also noticed cool extremities. I think there was some concern for uh, early cardiogenic shock when they initially saw her. And I'll show you the first set of labs that they got. Again, drawing your attention to an elevated troponin, elevated BNP, and then also an elevated lactate. Um, so I think at this point, the attention in her care uh, was drawn to the fact that she was presenting with abdominal pain, had tenderness there, and then had this elevated lactate. And there was immediate suspicion for bowel ischemia. And because of that, she was quickly brought um, into a CT of her abdomen and pelvis with contrast. Uh, down in the ED. And that actually showed what the ED was worried about and what they were suspecting, which is an occlusion of the superior mesenteric artery. Um, and even though it was an abdomen pelvis scan, the last uh, few superior slices of the scan showed this. So what you can see here is there's a linear opacification in the left atrium. A radiologist read this. Um, as a possible uh, thrombus, actually. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, the, the real reason for the scan was to look for bowel ischemia, uh, which was seen. So later that day, the patient was actually taken to the OR. Oh, and then I'll, I'll mention as well that this, uh, this CAT scan did show some PEs as well um, uh, in the lower segments of the lungs that were caught here. So, um, they found the SMA thrombus that they were worried about, and she was pretty quickly taken to the OR that afternoon. Uh, she had an SMA stent and by vascular, and as part of their workup, uh, they found uh, poor pulses in the right lower extremity. They ended up finding an arterial occlusion in her right lower extremity as well, and uh, she was taken for arterial thrombectomy in addition to the SMA stenting. During the case, she became a little unstable and was getting sicker throughout the case. So there was concern that she uh, was necrosing her bowel. The case was converted to an X-lap. Uh, they saw sort of the beginnings of dusky bowel, but uh, nothing that was clearly necrotic. So they didn't um, excise any bowel. They left her open and then she was brought to the ICU. So 
later that evening, I was on call, uh, this is at Clifton, and uh, they consulted me to come by uh, to the ICU to do a stat echo, given, in, given that she was having some worsening shock, to see if we could figure out um, what was going on. So I'll show you the images that I got. So as you can see here, um, pretty surprising finding. Um, I'll just mention this, this is also my uh, first stat echo ever uh, back in September. I realized when I was wheeling the echo machine across the bridge to the ICU that I'd chosen the machine that I had no idea how to work. And so I was calling all my co-fellows from bedside asking them how to record images. Thankfully managed to turn it on and got these images. Um, and you can see sort of a worm-like thrombus uh, that is traversing the atrial septum uh, through the LA and the RA and is prolapsing through both the mitral valve and the tricuspid valve. So this was a pretty dramatic finding. When I had come to see the patient, I actually hadn't heard about the CT finding of the left atrial thrombus. The focus again had sort of been on her SMA thrombus and bowel ischemia, and that's kind of why we thought she was very sick. Um, and uh, I was a little unprepared to, to see this. I'll show you one other view just for another perspective from the long axis, um, you can see the left atrial portion of it here prolapsing through the mitral valve. Um, so at this point, I kind of scrambled to call Dr. Izzy Adinso, um, who was on call with me, and uh, just asked her if I saw what I thought I was seeing, and she confirmed that I was. Um, and at that point, we kind of had to decide. It was getting later in the evening. We had to decide what the next steps were going to be for this very sick patient. Um, so before I go on to what we did next, I wanted to just step back and summarize the case here. So 81-year-old, as I mentioned, atrial fibrillation, not on anticoagulation, heart failure with reduced EF, and a few other comorbidities who came with abdominal pain and fatigue. So we found a clot in transit through the atrial septum. Um, we found evidence of right and left-sided embolization with her SMA thrombus, with her uh, popliteal thrombus, as well as the PEs, bowel necrosis, and kind of worsening distributive and cardiogenic shock. So at this point, um, we're starting to wonder, you know, what are our treatment options for thrombus and transit? And what, if any, data exist on this, given that it's, you know, a fairly rare entity? So um, I will be talking, you know, I'll mention a little bit again, uh, clot and transit through uh, PFO or through the atrial septum. But given that that's extraordinarily rare, there's really not much out there on it. So I'm, I'm going to mostly be focusing on clot and transit in general, and we can talk more about that. So first, just to quickly start on uh, terminology. So uh, thrombus or tra in transit or clot in transit kind of is variably defined as a thrombus that seems to not be adherent to a heart structure and also one um, that's from another part of the body. It's a little bit uh, ambiguously defined in that it's, it's kind of not clear if you can ever really be sure that it's not adherent to some portion of the heart and all that. So I think um, the slightly more accepted uh, entity that that we might be talking about today is a right heart thrombus. And I think a lot of the literature focuses on, on this type of phenomenon. It's a little bit of a less ambiguous definition. It does bring up the need to uh, distinguish this from other anatomic variants and other masses. So just to quickly mention those, um, I know essentially everyone on this call knows this better than I do, but a number of um, right atrial masses and uh, findings, including eustachian valve, carotid networks, crista terminalis, and then this is a, a myxoma here uh, that you can see on the final image, uh, all of which you kind of need to make sure that's not what you're looking at before you decide it's the thrombus. And then, you know, a little less common uh, to see an isolated RV thrombus, but it definitely happens. And a number of things that we need to distinguish this from in the RV as well. Moderator bands, prominent papillary muscles that you can see here, hypertrabeculation, and then tumor as well. I think the tumor shown here is metastatic SCC invading into the uh, RV here. So uh, after we've established that we're indeed dealing with a thrombus rather than one of the structures shown on the previous slide, um, there is at least one classification system that's used to describe the type of thrombus. Uh, the image here and the next couple of images that I'll show are from a 1989 uh, paper that reviewed 119 echocardiographically uh, diagnosed right heart thrombi. It was called the European Cooperative Study on the Significance of Right Heart Thrombi. 
Um, and they broke this down into three different types of thrombus. The first one is type A, um, generally described as worm-like in appearance and usually associated with DVT and PE and, and typically uh, the most common thrombus that's seen in the right heart. I think very consistent with the images that I showed you from, uh, from our case here, worm-like uh, sort of long and, and mobile as well. They described a type B thrombus, which is one that's thought to have originated from within the heart and uh, typically ovoid, often clearly adherent to the wall and often seen in patients with underlying structural abnormalities of the heart. And then last is a type C thrombus. Uh, these are considered to be sort of the grab bag uh, category and that it is highly mobile, sort of ambiguous origin and of ambiguous clinical significance as well. So um, just wanted to spend a few minutes kind of reviewing what literature, what early literature there was on the management of clot and transit as well, now that we have a little bit of background on it. So the same paper that I was just showing you images from, this is from this 1989 working group, um, where it seems that they basically sent a questionnaire to many of the large echo labs in Europe at that time. They got responses from 30 centers. They collected a little bit of data on 119 patients. And as I mentioned, they kind of stratified this by thrombus type. So um, here you can see some of uh, their very basic results. So uh, the, again, they broke this up in terms of mortality, early mortality in the first couple of weeks. And the A and B here are the thrombus type. So A being um, what's considered to be sort of more of an embolized thrombus from um, a DVT. And you can see they had really three different treatment options, full dose anticoagulation, lysis, and surgery. The authors kind of concluded here that surgery may be the most effective approach for, um, for treatment, but you can see that the numbers here are, are really incredibly small. Um, not a whole lot of data on why each of these options uh, were chosen. And then of course, you know, with little or no treatment, it really makes you wonder if um, e each of these options were chosen just because of the clinical status of the patient. So, um, you know, Importantly, one of the first efforts to look at treatment options and to look at outcomes for these patients. Um, but you know, still, I think a lot of uh, a lot to be learned in terms of what we could do to manage this. So there was another group, um, actually, in the same year, Kinney and Wright, who did a meta-analysis of the published case reviews. So this wasn't a questionnaire, but they looked at anything that they could find from the late '60s. Um, to the time of publication in the 80s. And they actually strangely found um, 119 patients, not the same patients. And again, looked at three different treatment options. So anticoagulation, lysis, surgery, and no treatment. Um, their conclusion from this paper, um, and they actually took a step to uh, do a logistic regression of sort of the very basics of the patient characteristics, what could be gleaned from the, uh, from the published data. We're basically suggesting that no treatment um, was worse than treatment, but that there wasn't any clear evidence that any of the available treatments was uh, better than the other. You can see here, um, they also found in this one, interestingly, that when a right heart clot was found in the setting of PE, there was much higher mortality. I think probably not surprising to any of us to see this, but I think the suggestion that in those cases, you may, may be more dealing with the type A thrombus, something that's in the process of embolization or it's partially embolized. Whereas maybe some of these cases we're seeing a right heart clot without an associated PE is kind of that type B thrombus, something that's formed in the heart, adherent to the wall and unlikely to embolize. So um, fast forward a little bit here to 2002, and there's another group who took up this effort again. Um, they did a pooled analysis of a few more patients, so we're up to 177 patients now. Um, similar timeframes, uh, you know, stretching back into the 60s and then now extending to the present. Um, and um, they again tried to adjust based on you know, a little bit of data, including age, sex, the therapy, and some outcome data. Again, looking at the three different treatment options. So we have heparin, surgery, and lysis here. Um, you can see here that you know, the, the first paper I mentioned may be slightly favorable towards surgery. 
in this paper, uh, lysis had a stati statistically significant uh, lower mortality associated with this. So some suggestion with you know a few more patients, maybe a little bit of a more robust uh, statistical analysis that lysis may be more appropriate option, you know, but certainly still without an actual trial and you know really looking at case reports and retrospective data, a lot of concern that this could be heavily confounded by you know, what the patient's coming in with and existing comorbidities that are, you know, tipping the uh, caregivers to one type of treatment or the other, rather than kind of trying to find the most uh, evidence-based best approach. So I'll fast forward a little bit here. Um, oh yeah, and so I'll just show you the, uh, the odds ratios here. Again, statistically significant that uh, both surgery and just full dose anticoagulation were associated with uh, increased mortality compared to lytics. So then a few years later, another group wanted to look at this again. Um, this time they were actually able to find 328 patients. They eliminated patients with contraindications to any therapy. And then they did, again, trying to make a little bit more of a robust analysis. And they did a multivariate logistic regression um, here they accounted for both clinical and echocardiographic variables. I'll show you their data here. So um, they stratified based on hemodynamically stable and unstable patients. Uh, all they could really say here in terms of probability of survival was that um, anticoagulation seemed to be worse than either lytics or, or um, surgery. Um, so, you know, they also tried to show that lytics may have been slightly superior to surgery. I think that was of borderline statistical significance. Um, but, you know, for those that are kind of keeping track of where we are, we had the European working group that said that surgery was best. Uh, the Kenny group that showed that maybe all therapies were equal. And then the two more recent studies at this point um, suggesting that lytics were best. Uh, you know, collectively at this point, I don't know that this would have given any more clarity in terms of the best approach for a right heart thrombus in these patients. Um, I kind of suspect that all of these treatment decisions at this point and anybody kind of looking at the available data and trying to make a decision, we're going to be making a decision based on the patient's clinical status, sort of available resources and available expertise. Um, and, uh, you know, and that's kind of where things left off in 2005. But um, for sort of the second half of what I want to talk about just for a few minutes here, um, I think many of you know these three treatment options are no longer our only treatment options. And catheter-based therapies have kind of emerged on the scene as one of the options for management, not only of PE, uh, you know, which we do a fair amount here as well, but also for right heart thrombus as well. Um, so we can spend a couple uh, minutes reviewing these therapies. So I know, uh, you know, several of you on this call know these devices far better than I do, and I'll just try to uh, briefly uh, review them. But the first that I'll talk about is um, a device called the Flow Retriever, uh, made by Inari. It's a 20 French venous catheter, uh, 95 centimeters, and the catheter is called the Retriever 20 device. And you can see that in the, the top image here. So it's used as a suction thrombectomy uh, device that's supposed to be guided by both fluoro and echo. Um, and after uh, using this for a suction thrombectomy, the, uh, the device actually sort of converts into a guide, which can be used to deploy a mechanical thrombectomy device. And that's what you see on the bottom image here, um, if there's any evidence of residual thrombus. So originally designed for PE and frequently used for PE or central venous thrombus, um, but it's actually become the only device that's been approved for right atrial thrombus and um, often you know, used for right heart thrombus in general as an off-label indication. Um, if I can get this to work, I'll, they have a kind of cool video on their uh, website. So I'm gonna just try to show you this. I don't know that. Uh, Guidewire is advanced past the target clot in the pulmonary artery. With the dilator in place, the Trever 20 is advanced over the wire until it reaches the target clot. The dilator is removed, and with the flush port stopcock closed, the syringe is pulled back and locked into place. Opening the stopcock releases the vacuum and creates a high flow, volume capped aspiration, minimizing blood loss while drawing clot through a continuous lumen into the syringe. 
If clot remains, the appropriately sized flow retriever catheter is then introduced. As the catheter is retracted, the nitinol discs self-expand, engaging the clot from within. Retraction of the atraumatic discs liberates clot from the vessel walls as it is delivered back into the Trever 20. Guide wire is advanced. So just a little explanation there of how that device is deployed for PE. And then, you know, typically when used for right heart thrombus, it's, um, you were usually just using it as a suction thrombectomy device rather than anything mechanical. Um, so that's one of these devices that's used for this and has been used uh, here as well. Um, the next is a, a device called AngioVac. I'm sure uh, many of you are familiar with as well. So this is a 23 French suction catheter, no uh, mechanical thrombectomy component to this one, but a much different sy system, interestingly. So it's, it's coupled to an extracorporeal venovenous bypass and there's a separate infusion catheter. Um, Again, mostly designed for DVT, but can be used for right heart clot as well. Um, the device is, is not very maneuverable. So uh, rarely, I think if ever used for PEs because it's really difficult to get into the pulmonary arteries. Um, but I it, it think actually AngioVac is working on a new more maneuverable device. So this is gonna be uh, used hopefully for PEs as well um, and allow a little more manipulation of the catheter itself. Um, sort of speaking to some of the folks that have used this device here. Um, this is nice because you can kind of put on continuous suction if you're not sure exactly where your clot is or if you wanna just uh, try to you know, get a lot of clot out, but takes obviously more setup and uh, difficult to mobilize more quickly, I think, especially for uh, cardiology folks versus CT surgery, because this does require perfusionists to be involved as well. So, um, you know, some additional staffing, some additional expertise, you know, when you read about this on the manufacturer's website, it kind of says like, it can be set up, you know, within minutes and get going. But I think practically um, it does take a little bit of experience and does take a little more time and effort to mobilize a whole team to get this going. So the last one that I'll briefly mention is this penumbra system. It's an aspiration system, um, some smaller French catheters, and it is connected to kind of this intelligent pump system. It's supposed to be a little bit of a hybrid system between the uh, prior two devices in that it's on technically on continuous suction, um, but there's no need for a uh, reperfusion catheter. Uh, the reason being is that it, it has this sort of smart suction technology where you're on intermittent suction until the device senses that you know you haven't engaged a thrombus and then it'll go on continuous suction and kind of come off when it, it feels that it's not engaging thrombus. So no need for reperfusion, but in theory may allow you to do um, sort of more aggressive uh, therapy. Um, Designed for DVT and PE to some extent, um, I was talking to Dr. Jabber about this one. I, I think this device is, uh, is really challenging to navigate into the pulmonary artery. So I think really rarely used for right heart thrombus or PE and more for peripheral clots. I think part of the appeal with this device and maybe part of the reason some people are using this one from what I understand is that it can also be used for the, the pump can sort of be used for coronary aspiration as well. And there's a lot of different catheters, a lot of different sizes. So you can kind of get to smaller branches in the venous system as well as the arterial system and kind of use uh, one pump and, and exchangeable catheters for a variety of different cases. But um, I did see, you know, the sort of fun thing about this topic is a lot of people when they run into these cases of right heart thrombus or, um, the cases where it, you know, it's traversing a PFO, they, a lot of people tend to post this on Twitter. So I saw at least one case where uh, someone had used this device to, to engage a right heart thrombus, but I think a little bit less typically used. So um, I want to go back to our case presentation and um, talk a little bit about where we are. So as I mentioned, um, in the morning, you know, we get the CT scan that shows the PEs, arterial thrombus. Uh, she goes in for stenting of the SMA, a lower extremity procedure in the axe lap. And then at night, we find that she's got this thrombus in transit through the PFO. So, um, you know, Dr. Izzy Denso and I are trying to figure out what the best uh, mode of management is for this pa patient. And um, in the evening, we consulted both CT surgery and interventional cardiology to see uh, what they thought about this. 
you know, given uh, the images I showed you where there's a really large uh, thrombus in the left atrium kind of tra traversing the mitral valve there as well, there was a concern amongst the interventional team that um, any effort to, to get out the existing thrombus would cause um, sort of a catastrophic embolization to the arterial system, given the shoe is really tenuous already. They felt that was too dangerous. And sort of both the interventional team and the cardiac surgery team felt that at least that evening um, that she, you know, was really too sick for any procedure and that we just needed to continue her on anticoagulation, kind of hope that she could make it to the morning and that we could pursue, um, you know, another procedure in the morning. So um, that did happen um, on the morning of the 11th, the cardiac surgery team um, took her to the OR, but given, you know, that she was so sick and really tenuous, they felt she was too open for, or too uh, unstable for the open procedure that they had planned. So they actually opted to do a catheter-based procedure at that point to see what they could do. Uh, they placed two venous, um, femoral venous sheaths. So a left 26 French and a right uh, 17 French. The right was used for reperfusion. And that uh, left sheath was used to deploy the Angiovac uh, device. They used echo and flora guidance. I just wanted to uh, read a short bit of their operative report, which was pretty incredible. So uh, they wrote, we slowly advanced the uh, cannula and began venovenous bypass and engaged the thrombus. Almost within seconds, the embolic material was engaged in the injury back device and disappeared from echocardiographic view. They, uh, you know, they did a, a close examination of the left heart as well. They couldn't find any thrombus there. They also mentioned that they compared the CT images and the echo images to the size of the cloth that they got out, which was actually about uh, 10 centimeters. And it seems like they felt they had gotten the entire clot uh, through this thrombectomy, luckily, which, um, you know, we're hopeful would be lead to a good outcome for this patient, although she was really critically ill at that point. Um, unfortunately, that's not what happened. So after that procedure, she was again taken to X lab. She did not have a bowel resection at that point. They put in an IVC filter and they had to do a repeat popliteal thrombectomy, um, given that arterial thrombus um, had not resolved. So she kind of held on for the next few days, although I think it was becoming increasingly clear that um, she was really critically ill and, and had a number of other things going on. So three days later, she really kind of suddenly crashed when she was in the ICU quickly and four presser shock um, and really crumping quickly in the ICU. And the um, actually the vascular surgery team happened to be in the room when this happened and quickly initiated a bedside X lap um, as the general surgeons were rushing up to help as well. Ultimately ended up having 50 centimeters of further resection of her bowel on the 14th, um, leaving only 120 centimeters of small bowel left and it became clear at this point that they really weren't out of the woods that remaining 120 uh, centimeters of small bowel looked really unhealthy and it was becoming clear she was going to be on lifelong TPN at this point. Um, she had another x lap the next day they didn't resect anything at this point and then on the 20th again she became kind of unstable it's taken again for another um, small bowel resection um, in four presser shock at this point, you know, obviously the um, primary teams here had done a great job talking to the family, helping them understand the severity of what was going on and um, had uh, a goals of care conversation. She was uh, made DNR at this point and then later in the day in uh, worsening shock and lactic acidosis, so she had a PA arrest and, and passed in the ICU. So, um, you know, I think unfortunately for this patient, um, she was almost guaranteed to have a really poor prognosis from the minute she hit her uh, emergency room, just because she, we knew she had pre-existing um, left and right-sided thrombi, a really challenging case um, with, you know, um, problems going on in multiple areas of the body. I think there was some concern she was having strokes during this as well which is of course not surprising. Um, as we saw from the early papers describing this phenomenon, even with just an isolated right heart thrombus, mortality is really incredibly high. And then when you have uh, embolization through um, 
the left-sided system as well. I, I think it, it, this becomes a really challenging case. Um, anecdotally, I'll say that um, Dr. Jabber has a couple examples of doing this, including one where he did do a catheter-based thrombectomy of um, a clot that had traversed through a PFO, and that patient did well. So it's certainly possible, but I think early uh, diagnosis with echo and early recognition of the case is really key. So I just wanted to, um, towards the end here, I think I'll probably finish a little early, but uh, this is just another case that we had here on the Hartfield service at Midtown. Um, just wanted to give you a little preview of, of how this can go maybe a little differently and um, different options for management. So this was a 59 year old gentleman. Uh, he had known by ventricular heart failure, EF in the twenties, um, some RV dysfunction as well, a number of other comorbidities who, um, had a witness syncopal episode, uh, was transferred from the VA to us. Uh, you can see the CT images here on the right um, show, um, this was done in the ED, so showing bilateral uh, PEs. Um, I know my, the image quality isn't great here. If you can tell, the left-sided clot burden is kind of significantly higher. So he came in in the middle of the night, um, he had a troponin of 0 0.8 at that point. He had an elevated BMP, which was kind of hold, holding on, actually admitted to the floor initially, put on anticoagulation, and then an echo was ordered, which was done first thing in the morning. I'll show you that echo. So um, here I am four months into fellowship, and this is my second case of thrombus in transit. You can see Again, what we would probably describe as a type A thrombus, kind of worm-like, um, likely to have embolized from uh, a distant source. And um, we later confirmed this patient had sort of extensive uh, bilateral DVTs in, in both of his legs. Um, so uh, the person reading echoes gave me a call on this one. Um, you know, this patient actually uh, was just on a liter or two of oxygen, fairly normal blood pressures, you know, mildly tachycardic, um, but, but doing relatively well. But as soon as we saw this, realized he had, um, you know, really high risk for a terrible outcome in, in the coming hours. So uh, consulted the interventional team for consideration of uh, catheter-based uh, thrombectomy. And he was taken to the cath lab pretty soon after that. So um, here's an image of what they were shooting. You know, actually, as they were getting this patient on the table, who I mentioned was kind of doing fairly well, he became acutely agitated and, um, and really, really sick. He started to become hypotensive, much more hypoxic, unable to lie flat. And the team had theorized that they think they may have actually witnessed him embolizing that right heart clot on the table because when they got up to the right heart, there wasn't any thrombus there anymore. So um, they think that it may have embolized. Um, here they're shooting the left system. And as we saw on the uh, CAT scan, his, uh, his CT showed that his left side of thrombus burden was greater. I didn't don't have great images of the right side, but he had extensive right-sided uh, clot burden as well. And so the, the thinking was probably that he had embolized um, that, that large thrombus that we saw in the right atrium into, um, into the right pulmonary artery. So this is kind of the before picture. Um, this is the flow retriever system. So um, this is uh, the suction thrombectomy. Um, they're using it um, both as a guide for um, doing their fluoro, but also they're using it um, for suction thrombectomy. And um, again, you know, this this is something that I think Dr. Jabber was saying he, you know, uses a little bit more frequently than the angiovac system. It's a little easier to manipulate, and then also um, it, you know, doesn't require perfusion. It doesn't, uh, you know, you can kind of do it with one sheet. Um, so they uh, they actually had to put in another venous and arterial sheet just because he was so sick, but kind of simplifies the procedure. I'll show you um, some of the after pictures. They had done a couple of runs on the right already and here they are moving to the left. This is kind of a post view, not exactly the same shot, but I think you can see that um, he's having much better perfusion after their work. Um, Iman, I think was the interventional fellow. I think he must have taken some of these pictures and actually uploaded it to the patient's chart, which is great. So you can see the extensive thrombus burden that they got here and then 
they were able to capture some data about how he was doing before and after the case. So you can see kind of a dramatic improvement in the uh, right atrial pressure, some improvement in the PA uh, pressures as well, and then a huge improvement in uh, PA saturation from the uh, 20s to the 50s. This patient, um, actually, you know, he had a really challenging course. Anyone who's probably been at Midtown in the past couple of months um, knows this gentleman, but, um, you know, of course, complicated by cardiogenic shock and a number of infections in um, the coming weeks, but actually ended up doing okay and left the hospital to rehab um, a couple of weeks ago. And, and I think kind of the quick action of the interventional team here allowed that to happen. So a little bit of a different uh, viewpoint of, of how this can happen. Um, so I'm going to finish a little early, early here, I guess, but just wanted to share a few of my conclusions. So right heart thrombus uh, confers high risk of mortality. This is especially true if um, we're crossing a PFO as in the initial case and embolizing to the left system as well. Um, prior treatment options, anticoagulation, lytics, surgical thrombectomy, I think despite a couple efforts to find out which one of those was most effective, really no clear treatment option. and, and uh, management at that point really based on what expertise was available. Um, catheter uh, thrombectomy is now becoming um, an accepted treatment for this, even if off-label and um, something that requires further investigation for efficacy and safety. Um, so I'll just quickly say thanks to Dr. Izzidinso and Dr. Hawk, um, who helped me uh, kind of manage this really challenging patient in the few, first few days before the C search team and um, her rest, the rest of the teams kind of took over her care. And, and thanks a lot to Dr. Jabber. He has some pretty incredible images of, of cases uh, that he's done as well and a lot of expertise in this area. Um, I know that probably a lot of you have dealt with these cases and just in chatting with uh, many of my attendings, I think um, these cases are hard to forget. So if anyone does have cases, I'd love to hear about them in the future. I think it's certainly an area that uh, further work is needed. And, um, and uh, if you know, there's any questions or people want to share um, anecdotes from prior experience with this, um, certainly can take some questions now. Uh, thank you, Colin. Those are some outstanding cases. And you're right. I, you know, I mean, the, the lady, the first case you described, obviously was going to be extraordinarily difficult from the get go, particularly when you, you know, someone with chronic systolic heart failure and you know, other comorbidities. Um, that was going to be a very difficult one from the get go, I guess. You know, a lot of the data you show primarily deals with right-sided thrombus when you when you complicate it with left-sided or systemic emboli, it really makes things much more difficult. So just if you will talk us through, you know, like if 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 you come across anything other than, you know, you know, would lytics be something you would even consider for someone who's already had a systemic emboli given, you know, the bleeding risk that maybe associated with that? Or, you know, when you throw in systemic emboli, how does that change sort of your thought process with these patients? Yeah, you know, there's, I was looking at um, the available uh, case reports, and there are actually a number, I think, in total, there's been about 100 published cases of a clot and transit through a PFO. Um, and it sort of runs the gamut in terms of treatment options. And because the catheter-based approaches are so new, there's really almost nothing that's published on this topic, maybe one or two cases. But for those um, you know, sort of older uh, reports, people have used lytics. I think the concern is, and certainly the concern for us in this case was, if you successfully lyse this, you have essentially what we found out was five centimeters of thrombus on the left side that could go anywhere. And I think there's just a lot of concern that, you know, that uh, lytics are, are going to make things a lot worse rather than better. Patients are super high risk for bleeding, as you mentioned. And, you know, there was concern, although it was never really able to be proven that she was having um, strokes as well. And so concern for hemorrhagic conversion there. So we did briefly talk about lytics, but it was similar to thinking about, um, you know, a catheter-based approach initially where we were worried that if you if you go up into the right system, you try to um, get out what you can or, or lice things that you're gonna uh, have a catastrophic event on the left side. And um, I think, you know, most of these patients that I've read about have done poorly. And, and that was true for the cases that I read about with Lytics um, as well. And I just have a quick one case I did see a few years back. It was a young guy who came in, 
with a PE and then it had a paradoxical embolus as well. And I'd, I'd really just have his EKG and I'll need to find it and get it to you. But he has sort of S1, Q3, T3, as well as sort yeah. of cerebral T waves going on at the same time from sort of concomitant PE and, and stroke. He ended, up, he ended up doing okay because he was a young, otherwise healthy male in his 20s. Wow. Um, but had clearly a dramatic EKG and presentation, but I think just did well ultimately with just anticoagulation. So. Wow. Love to see that EKG. <laughs> Sounds like a great one. All right. Well, that's all I've got unless anyone else has questions that I can answer. More questions from the group. And if I anybody... just, uh, this is Ijama. I just wanted to acknowledge Colin um, on that high quality echo so early in his fellowship for somebody who um, I think that was the first one, as he said, that he had done. Um, it was a very, very complicated case and being able to have that um, and for all of us, myself and the interventionists on call, just to try to make decisions and even CT surgery to quickly look at that uh, and help us decide what were the possible options and, and what were not options and what were post greater risk made a big difference. So kudos to Colin for that. Thanks, Dr. Azid. And so I can say the uh, subsequent uh, T TTEs I've done have not all looked like that, but <laughs> so if anybody uh, has cases um, that they ever want to share with me, I'd love to kind of get a little collection of these uh, at some point. So please reach out to me if you have one that you'd like to share. Well, thank you, Colin. Uh, wonderful uh, cases and a uh, nice review of the literature, what, what does exist. So I uh, appreciate it this morning and thank you everybody yeah, and we'll, thanks we'll see you next week the preceding program is copyrighted by emory university